Good morning, one and all. Is that the right button? No. I'm completely out of uh, out of sync now, aren't I? Uh, good morning, one and all. Welcome to another Mr. Businessman. Um, yeah, um, we didn't do a stream on Friday. Uh, I say we. I didn't do a stream on Friday. Um, so if you're watching this live, then uh, the reason that being that uh, the... We had to decide what I was going to do in terms of moving forward. Um, so I thought I'd spend a, a little bit of time trying to work through some resources and stuff and get some stuff ready for you. However, um, the what I decided to do is I thought, you know what? Let's start taking our tentative steps into second year. All right. Because we've pretty much done. And, and it's not exhaustive. I mean, there are one or two bits that I've not covered. Like... Um, you know, there's there's a couple of like very like small topics that are pretty important, but you've already got them. And um, remember, this isn't supposed to you know replace everything that we ever do, <laughs> but it's supposed to help. Um, so I will go back to them all, uh, otherwise anyway. But I just thought, in terms of new material, uh, because I know some people are you know um, chomping at the bit to to sort of get on and and be you know progressing on to new stuff not even stuff not even revision stuff like brand new stuff um i thought you know what let's have a look let's start having a look at second year stuff shall we so um the issue will be for those of you who usually have the packs um that you won't have the packs but what i'm going to do is i'm going to upload the packs um onto teams and then you're going to have access to them um as well so if you want them you, you've got access to them there okay so um yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to start off, uh, as I said, and I'm not going to go into crazy detail. I'm not going to go into, like, you know, really hardcore detail about all this because, um, you know, there's more to do, if that makes sense. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot more prop to, prep to do. There's a lot more exam stuff to do in the second year. Um, but, you know, the information, we can get the information out to you, can't we? And then at least you can you can sort of work with that and things like that. So I hope I find you well. Um, I hope I find you um, keeping safe and things like that, and not not being too freaked out by the, uh, you know, the government's uh, crazy stuff they're talking about all the time. Seems to completely contradict yourself. And and, and interestingly enough, <laughs> and I know it's weird because a lot of time on this uh, this channel, but it's it's very um, sort of current information that we're talking about or rather it's very applicable to real life isn't it um and uh one of the things which has been going on in the in the media and stuff and people are arguing about uh, especially in education is data um, and not having the scientific data and the government are keeping data away and things like that and it's and it's so important to have access to where they're getting their evidence from where's your evidence you know um so whether you're making business decisions or deciding whether or not to um to to you know open up an economy or send people back to work or whatever it is that that people are doing um then it's it's you know it's important to not only have the data to have reliable data and to be showing what data where the data's from and things like that as well so what we're going to be doing today is we'll have a little look at some data analysis um and uh and show you some some places where they can get information from and then when we go on to the news i'll see if i can pull out some um some actual data or if I can find any, um, I was I had a quick look on BBC News before, and it wasn't massively forthcoming. Um, but we'll have a look. All right, so let's get straight into it. So yeah, so welcome to Component Two. Component Two is the start of um, Unit. Well, it's it's the it's the start of the second year of uh, the A level business spec. However, a lot of the stuff that's in this is very applicable to B tech as well. It's not specifically, you know, I don't tend to to differentiate between B tech and A level like that because I find it easier to to just be down the line. It's the same content at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, so this is this is how the the second year begins, and we start with data analysis. It says so the objectives are presenting pie charts, histograms, and index numbers. Explain the um, methods of presenting data, histograms, index number, pie charts, bar charts, maps, line graph. Discuss the reasons for the use of each method. All right. And there is a textbook if you want to get hold of it. Uh, year 2 A-level business textbook. Um, it's. Uh, I will put the... I'll, I'll send you the details if you want them. Um, you won't probably be able to get access to it at this moment in time. But usually you can get it from your college um, 
for your schools at library or they'll be able to get you a copy and stuff like that so pretty useful i'm not i'm not one for massively reading up on stuff like this I, it can be helpful but um usually find that if you make good notes and you know listening to your teacher spending time with them and th in terms like that is is the best way to get through this information rather than just reading a book but if you are at a loose end at the minute you want to have a look lots of stuff online um tutor to use a pretty good resource although it can be a bit a bit bland um Okay, and it says speci uh, the specification uh, specification requirement, presenting, interpreting, and an analyzing data, e.g. pie charts, histograms, index numbers. All right, so let's jump straight in, if it'll let me. So, first things first, we've got um, this on the, on the left-hand side. Now, you might not have done um, pie charts and, and line graphs and stuff like this. You might not have done them since you were at school. And this is the problem. This is what um, confuses people. And this is what, um, you know, makes people feel uh, uncomfortable about um, doing this bit of the course, really. They always go, oh, yeah, well, I haven't done that since I went to high school. And the point is that you... you um, when you look at these things, it's quite... Um, they're quite simple. They don't need to be overthought. The... the, the the sort of skill that comes from the student at this point is being able to interpret the data and adequately give, you know, um, you know, examples and, and use it in your answers effectively and things like that. So that's what they're looking for from you. They're looking for you to uh, to be consistently um, being able to interpret the data. It's the interpretation and evaluation of the data which is more important than the actual presentation. They do want you to be able to use them and things like that, but it's not as important as being able to actually physically interpret the data and, and make a reasoned judgment. Because remember, it's that same thing again, isn't it? Giving uh, positives and negatives, and then you know, um, doing your conclusion, rounding up the the answer into a into a better way of of thinking, and and, and a full constructed um answer as well that, that that sums up both the points and gives a a justification so it says here uh, we've got the market share of the uk grocery market we've got tesco as the sainsbury's morrison's others summerfield summerfield this must have been from a while ago they don't exist anymore uh waitrose aldi little i think they were bought by asda or morrison's Comments in the uh, in the in the live chat if you if you know. <laughs> uh, assess the usefulness of the data that is represented in the pie chart to one of the UK's leading supermarket chains such as Tesco. Eight marks. Okay. Now this is what we would be looking for. Now how is this pie chart useful? Okay. So what is it physically showing? Well, the first thing I'd say, the first thing I'd always talk about this kind of stuff before we get into the nitty gritty of stuff. Use your common sense, you know. And it's not like common sense that Boris Johnson was talking about. It's it's that genuine common sense. Um. Look at the data. You can see it. We put it in a pie chart because it's easy to read. So I know that it's quite difficult to see because it's in black and white. Um, but on here, I don't know if you can see it, but it, the, the big one, um, this one here, uh, it says 31%. Uh, now, even if even if you couldn't see, you would be able to tell me which one, um, even if you couldn't see you know, the name of that, you would be able to tell, tell, tell me that there would be a dominant force in this industry, wouldn't you? And the reason that you'd be able to tell me that is because it's really, really easy to see. It, the big um, the big dark sort of mass on the right-hand side, which actually makes up 31%, um, is is blatantly dominant, isn't it? Now, if you look on the right-hand side, you've got the data actually done, and they will usually do this for you as well. They'll usually give it you in a, in a data format as well in terms like this. So they've been nice enough to put them in order for you. So who is that big mass on the right hand side? Well, it's Tesco, isn't it? They've they've rounded up thirty point nine percent to thirty one percent because we've got to have that'd be a problem, isn't it? You've got to round up in pie charts and stuff like that because otherwise you'd have a tiny little sliver that was left. It needs to add up to a hundred, um, and then you'd be able to tell me about the other ones. But without even seeing the Tesco as the Sainsburys, I wonder how hard it would be for people who know a little bit about the about business, a little bit about um, supermarkets, to be able to. Um, adequately tell me which one's which you know you'd probably say well who's second in command you know asda is well known they're owned by walmart aren't they so they are well known to be being dominant in that market we've got sainsbury's after that we've got morrison's others 11.7 percent uh waitrose down the bottom and, and little and aldi this is probably yeah I, I don't know when this is from but it, it's uh it's probably different than that now because we've had new new entrants into the market. We've had um, Food Warehouse, that's uh, Iceland. Uh, and uh, Aldi and Lidl have been doing very well, especially at this moment in time when everybody's, you know, struggling for cash and things like that. 
Okay. So he says, how is this pie chart useful? It's easy to see the information. It's quick to see the information. It's easy to interpret the information of what's going on because it's very easy to, to understand. What does it not show and what, what might be useful? Well, it doesn't show the why does it it doesn't show and, and some of it isn't very specific either it doesn't differentiate between bits of the business which is specific like tesco is a very large company they have lots of different sections to it doesn't it it doesn't show profitable bits and non-profitable bits it doesn't make it doesn't show uh, over time it just shows a snapshot right this second like i'm saying the problem for me is i don't know when this data is from because it isn't stated so i my first thing if i was going to have a jab at this would be when's this data from because i'm sure little and aldi are a lot more dominant in the market especially aldi um in the market than they used to be and i know little has really uh, you know push themselves to be improving in terms of they've got a bakery on site they've got all these different things now um so yeah that's what i would be pulling it to bits and it says um what decisions or uh, discussions may it allow well one of the big things that that the pie charts are used and, and and data in general before we get onto pie charts specifically but a lot of the things these this data analysis is used for is just these overall big arguments of going we'll look at ourselves you know who do we need to be benchmarking against if I was, you know, someone like uh, Asda, I'd be looking at Tesco and going, well, how is it that they've nearly doubled our our, um, our market share? You know, we're in a really saturated market, we're in a really competitive market, and yet there's one dominant force which is making a massive difference. Why is that? So that's what that's what I would be leading my discussions with. If I was a senior senior member of Asda, I'd be saying, right, we need to be having a look at Tesco. What are they doing? Is it the efficiencies? Is it the um, morale? Is it the recruitment? Is it the um, you know capacity utilization? Is it the way that they're marketing stuff? Is it the way that they're uh, you know? Is it some kind of branding? You know, there's all these to talk. But this is the start, isn't it? This is what it shows you where you should be aiming. Who do we want to be taking on? For these and also um, for the same point if we were looking at the ones with the the lowest so you you, you wear trolls your aldi your little um the more specialized aren't they the more specialized markets because what because one's quite expensive and, and the others are quite cheap um who should we be going for and interestingly enough summerfield um, which was 3.7%, uh, slightly higher than Waitrose, was kind of like, uh, there used to be another one called Quicksave, um, and these were um, ones that, that were taken over by bigger companies. You know, So if I was one of these Tesco, Asda, Sainsbury's, Morrison's people up there, probably mainly the, uh, you know, Sainsbury's, Asda's and Tesco's more than Morrison's because they're only, you know, the 10%. It's still decent, but... Um, I would be looking at right. Well, who could we take over? Would it be worth it? Do we really need to, you know, extend ourselves, or could we use the branding of, you know, a Summerfield? You know, why is um, I think they said didn't they? Wasn't it Tesco recently was going to bring out another brand and they were going to call it something slightly different? Um, but essentially it was just going to be a cheap version of Tesco. Um, because they do this, they do the smart price and stuff like that. But it's about the branding of why you would go to the shop, whether you would actually go to the shop in the first place, isn't it? Okay. Um, and I know that, and also when you're looking at it, it can also really help you with uh, looking at whether there is a saturated market. You know, should you be moving into foreign markets? Is there any more um opportunities in these markets or not? It'd be up for an argument, wouldn't it? Or should we move into foreign markets? Tesco try realize that they would um. They were struggling to uh, to make any more out of the British market and tried to move to uh, to foreign countries. They tried to move into the US with a with a company called uh, Fresh and Easy. It was Tesco, but just called Fresh and Easy, and it didn't work um, because the Americans said it was too clinical um, and they didn't like it. They have a uh, you know they're used to places like Target and where uh, sorry and um, what's the other one Walmart um, and. Uh, it was a completely different way of doing it. We, I mean, when you look at Tesco, it's not that nice, really, is it? You know, it is quite clinical in terms of, you know, you don't really know which one you're in in terms of that. You know, I'd say Morrison's have got it best in terms of feeling a bit more homely. Still don't really like the shop, but, you know, it's better than nothing. They, they try to make it more of a marketplace kind of thing. That's how they differentiate themselves, isn't it? But, um, yeah, okay, let's move on. So, data analysis. Different uh, data has a best method of being presented. And that, the, the reason it's best is because it's easy to implement, uh, sorry, easy to understand, easy to discuss, easy to show in a physical thing. Uh, it's vital that the firm selects the best method, method to display the data to ensure that it can be quickly and accurately interpreted. Really important, that, isn't it, that we don't misinterpret that data. Oh, I didn't realise it said that. Uh, remember, decisions can be made on the data presented thus 
Um, the better the data presented, the easier it is interpreted and analysed, and thus aids decision making. So basically, what we're saying is the better the data, the more uh, that the easier it is for people to see it quickly, and um, the better they are going to be able to interpret and use that data effectively. Okay. Now, usually we would do this in class, but obviously because we're not in class at the moment, it says in pairs identify five types of data or information business may want to collect or analyse. Um, secondly, how might you present these figures, market share, pie charts, that kind of stuff. So different types of data, we might want sales, we might want brand recognition, uh, we might want market share, we might want, um, you know, um, market like market recognition in terms of like uh, how much people understand our brand in terms of recognize us um, as the thing. Uh, you could have something like, uh, I'm thinking more market research than anything, you know, um, how people feel about a brand, how people um, feel about, you know, future products and things like that as well. That's a really, really good good way of doing it, isn't it? And analyzing that, so doing some kind of, you know, um, sort of, you know, a document which asks for people's opinions, a questionnaire perhaps or something like that uh, about potential future products and things like that as well. All right, so something like that. Now, first one we've talked about, which you might not have talked about in general, but you might not have talked about um, since high school, that kind of stuff, are histograms. All right. Now, histograms um, is got the word hist as in from history, and that's quite a case in point with these. So a histogram is a summary graph giving totals within various ranges of data. All right. Now, histograms show quantitative data. They don't say show qualitative. Um, qualitative is particularly difficult to show, remember, because qualitative, if you remember from the first year stuff, is about opinions. So it's very difficult to show that on on a uh, on a graph in that regard because you basically you have your own opinion don't you you can't give everyone their own specific part on the graph or it would just become useless the, the information very difficult to analyze uh, the data in the histogram is continuous there are no gaps between the bars so remember we were saying about not having that little bit extra left both the x-axis and the y-axis have a scale uh, the area of the bar is proportional to the frequency of each interval um, so basically, it's, it's very easy to see. I'll show you in a minute. It'll be easier to show. But basically, the bigger the, the thing, the the more you show it physically. I'll show you in a second. It makes more sense. A histogram is drawn using the data shown in the frequency table. And a frequency table is a table that lists items and usually tally marks to record and show the number of times they occur. From the table, a histogram such as the one above is created or rather below because we're going to show you. All right. So you get something like this. All right. So what we do is... To physically show it, um, and it's it's an interesting one because what we can do is we not only can do it up, but we can do it out as well, and that's what we're talking about. So the frequency of this actually happening means that we we don't just split it up by um, up and down; we split it up by width as well sometimes. So we can kind of draw attention to the bits of data that we want to to um, to look at. So if you look on the left-hand side here, we've got percentage of men spending at least one hour per week uh, participating in sports and exercise by age. Um, and, and as you can see, things like this. Now, in terms of um, 16 to 24, if you can see, we've, we've not... 16 to 24 is the same as, as uh, 25 to 34. Um, or, or thereabouts. It'll be slightly different, won't it? But it's because the difference between is the set. Excuse me. So we've got like 10 or 9. 10 or 9. If you look at down here, if we've got um, 74 and over 75, over 75 is a bigger block because it is more numbers. Does that make sense? So on here, um, we've got um, the height and width of the bars in the histogram plot clarifies information, sorry, carries information. So we've got our height, but we've also got the side as well. So this is going to be slightly more than this one. So we can. It's quite easy to read when once you've seen it. It's very, you know, like it's kind of like a physical, like a, um, it's kind of like a, a bar, ch it's not a bar chart, uh, a, a pie chart, a pie graph, um, that um is kind of like flat instead. That's what the, that's what it reminds me of. So if you were to flatten a pie chart, that's what you would get. So you've got um, you know, big thick ones for the forty percent over here because you've got more of the age group put into it. Um, over here, 97% of these people um, play video games, but it's quite a small minority, isn't it? So that's sort of sort of your, um, what is that, sort of 15 to 15 to 20, something like that. 
then you've got less here and you've got less here but we're showing aren't we it's quite easy to see that there is um quite specific bits of data that we can see on here that you can think well who should we be aiming our product at well let's have a look at the big big uh is there any small ones that are doing it well yeah look here well this is this is good because it allows us to target this market effectively doesn't it i would avoid doing these because we don't really know what age group we could basically go for the over 75s i suppose but it's going to be it's not very easy thing to market for isn't it whereas if we've got something like this it makes it a hell of a lot easier to market for it makes it a lot easier to make decisions of and it kind of kind of demonstrates to us where our um where our market is is broken up by wasn't it what what sort of segments we should be going for um so yeah so the basic ones anyway so histograms if you remember they go up and out um it's kind of like putting um a uh, a pie graph, the pie chart on the like if you were to flatten it and to show it like this, this is what it would look like. Um, because, what I mean by that is, if you remember on pie charts, the the it's really obvious we show the big chunkiness about like this, don't we? It's kind of like the same. Uh, but anyway, I hope that makes sense to you. It, it's uh, they're pretty good. Now, a, a graph showing quantitative data that is grouped into frequency rather than categories, as in a bar chart. A histogram is a bar uh, a bar graph of raw data that creates a picture of the data distribution. So the bars represent the frequency of occurrence by the class of data in a histogram. Uh, the area is the important thing, not just the height. All right, so out as well as up. Histograms are suitable for presenting market research data, like I said, uh, where age groups are not always the same width. So you might have a lot more or a lot less, like in gaming. Some um, age groups tend to game a lot more, so we'll talk about them a lot more. Uh, or income bands, because you might have a hell of a lot more people. If we were to look back at these and, and we were to mention income bands, you'd imagine that most people would be down here, so you'd have a lot more. These would be bigger width, wouldn't they, in terms of that, because you'd be getting uh, more people in terms of, or you know, let's say, you know, zero to 10 grand and then 10 grand to 20 grand if we're talking about salaries you'd probably see a lot more and then it would go less and less up here um so you'd have quite chunky bars because we'd start grouping in hundred thousand plus and millionaires and that would come into this because it wouldn't be worth talking about the vast majority of usable data that we'd want would probably be down here depending on the situation of course so benefits and disadvantages, we know we love a, we love a good uh, uh, benefit and disadvantage. So it shows the shape and distribution of a large set of data. Uh, which bar is the highest frequency? It's quite easy to see that, isn't it? Excellent when displaying data which have natural but not necessarily equal categories. So presenting data on age ranges for the holidays might be better. 18 to 25, 25 to 30, 30 to 50. If you remember, 18 to 25 and 30 to 50 aren't the same, are they? So showing that is clever because it, it draws your attention to it naturally. Uh, rather than each category, but uh, being a fixed number of years because some of them don't fit don't fit like that do they um can quickly see the large differences in the shape or symmetry of the data collected as well so is it affecting some more than others uh, limitations though can't depict exact values the frequency is spread across the whole band so if i want to say well how much does a 13 year old get him versus more than a 17 year old get him then you can't tell me that you can tell me as a, as a you know if, if the if the 13 year old was in a different bracket but but a 13 year old and an eight year old might be in the same bracket so you can't tell me anything specific about that you can just tell me across that um it may hide that 90 percent of the category between 25 to 30 is actually just age 26 <laughs> so it can be quite not useful sometimes if we start going, oh, well, 30-year-olds all play games. We go, no, it's just 26-year-olds for some reason. Seems to be there. Um, if the range of data is too wide, the effectiveness of the data falls, e.g. what's the value of analysing the age of magazine readership of 0 to 20, um, 20 to 40, etc. Because <laughs> 0, what's the point of doing that? You know, like it's it's going to be useless and it's, it's, it's bound to be zero. Um, is it even that useful to us? But it kind of makes us want to because you feel like you're missing stuff out. You're not getting a full, a full reflection if you don't, if you start missing bits of data out. Okay, second one's line graphs. Now, line graphs are used to compare two variables. Okay, you might have seen something like this talking about uh, interest rates, talking about inflation, um, talking about death rates at the minute. Um, so the x-axis uh, represents the continuous variable, e.g. time. So continuous as in it continues, it, it carries on, it's non-stopping. Um, and the y-axis represents the second variable or the quantity of value and things, something which we would we would plot on it. All right. So a line graph is plotted as a series of points and then joined together to produce a continuous line. 
Um, so up and down. And you can do a line of best fit that will show things. And worryingly, this is what the government are doing all the time at the minute. Um, but we'll talk about them in a second. Um, but uh, a line of best fit isn't always perfect because sometimes it can be you know bad or good. And sometimes you have to react to uh, old data because that's one of the things which is the negative about this is the fact of you can't get perfect right up to date data for this. Line graphs are a very useful presentation school for, uh, stu presentation tool for businesses. We've got market data or trends, sales, economic data, inflation, excuse me, GDP, financial data all the time, your profit levels and things like that. And you get something that looks a little bit, if I'll draw it, just stick it up there, like that. So UK inflation, as you can see, it's very easy to see um, what's happening here. So we had over here, uh, inflation drop down. Why is that? Well, it was just after 2008, we went into a massive recession, didn't we? Um, remember inflation is it's the time value of money how much your money is worth today versus how much it's worth tomorrow um so and then it went back up here then it goes down then it goes up but you can see it's quite easy to see if you were to draw a line of best fit you'd probably be going down wouldn't you essentially so inflation has been falling for the last couple of years over a 10 month period um so yeah it's quite easy to see it's good for that isn't it you, people like data that's easy to see you can bring it up in a meeting or something like that um, okay, next one, pie charts. So pie chart is a circular chart, pie shaped. Uh, it's split into segments to show percentages or the relative value of different categories of data. So very much like your histogram, but your histogram, remember, does it flat on it? Um, and 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 it it talks about frequency of thing. We don't really do that with this. We just show things like market. Um, market data and things like that so useful for presenting market income uh, market share products or brand sales percentage of a total so it's got to be as a percentage all right now um that's what the difference is between histograms and pie charts in that regard as well doesn't it it doesn't have to add up to 100 if you look at histograms if i just take you back to histograms a second these don't add up to 100 they don't they don't have to um because we're talking about percentages of something haven't we like a variable which it might have more it might have less but if you were to look at pie charts, they have to add up to 100 because they've got to add up to a pie, haven't they? Or we'd have pie left and that be, wouldn't be any useful to us. So we've got profit by region. And another thing it's really good for is it's really, really simple to see on the on the um, on here, isn't it? You can see really quickly. So you don't have to know uh, what's going on, but um, Europe looks like it's the biggest uh, profit by region for this company, um, closely followed by Latin America. Uh, although I'd have to have a look at the data because they're very, very similar. Um, of this it looks like the orange one is slightly bigger and that's one of the issues with it is it's quite difficult to be dead specific you know it gives us a basic overview but it doesn't give us enough to to really get down to the nitty-gritty of it so benefits of it good very easy and quick to read um visual in, uh, impression of the relative shares of the whole uh how much easier is it to see and interpret market shares in a pie chart rather than a list of figures so much easier isn't it if i show you something like that rather than just a list of figures and you go well wait a minute well tesco's is 30 point thing this is thing so i'll just have to order them if you see this and you go oh well tesco's is the orange one that's really good we've got a close second who could that be well it's probably asda so that means that asda have been doing really well what about this one and you can you can really easily have a look at that it says good for inter uh, inter firm comparisons so when you're doing your benchmarking when you're looking at you know maybe um how sales are laid out in the market how much you're selling in this how much bits of market and stuff are you selling a good method if you want to compare each part of a group with the whole group um so you can you can compare the smaller groups with the whole thing you know because remember it, uh, it does lead, it just add up to 100 so we, we know it's got to be a whole um, representation of the market or market share or whatever it is we're talking about limitations of pie charts though they don't give a very detailed information um sort of they don't give very detailed information they don't give an overall but they do give an overall picture don't they they don't give brilliant detail uh, don't show increases or decreases all the time it's just a snapshot in time i mentioned it earlier um and that's 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 representative for all of them the hist um the histograms as well are quite difficult in that regard. It doesn't show it all the time. It just shows a snapshot, doesn't it? Usually requires further additional information. How has the data changed all the time? Are we on the uprise? Are we on the down low? Together by itself isn't very useful. Um, good to show you, your shareholders if you're saying, oh, look, this is how we're doing today. But the answer would be, are we better? Are we worse? You know, okay. Now, one you might not have heard of before is index numbers. Now, index numbers... Um, are uh, they're like it's just a it's basically percentage change um so what we do is we allot a number 
to a a year or a uh, an amount of um, production or whatever it is that you want to compare um, and then we um, compare other years to that so that starts as say 100 that is the first one it's always going to start as 100 i'll show you why in a second but basically what we do is we say if this is 100 if this is 100 percent what has the next year been like in comparison to this year? What's the year after like in comparison to this year? So we've got a set. It says using a base year to compare all the other years against. So what is the first one that we want to compare to? Is it amount of you know basketball hoops scored? Is it the amount of press-ups you did? Uh, well, where are we going from? Let's do uh, year one, which was year one was 2010. All right, well, let's have a look at how many basketball hoops you shot shot in 2011 so then we've got to we've got to compare it to 2010 though to see if there is a you know a spread of data in terms of is it increasing is it decreasing so using the base year to compare all of the years against calculated by value in period divided by value in base period times 100 so basically it's what have we got now divided by what did we have then times 100 okay so very much like that percentage change things uh, we love that that in business don't we we like using the same one again and again Index numbers are usually uh, used to show changes over time in data. Uh, data becomes more easily comparable. Um, it uses the percentage change in the data compared to the base year. Okay, So we look at the percentage changes, what we're more interested in, rather than the data itself. Now, it says useful uh, for presenting changes in price levels over time, uh, changes in GDP, remember, gross domestic product, uh, over time, or inflation. Uh, very useful on that because it can show you uh, just a percentage. It shows you a, uh, an amount. It shows you a, a number that you can say, oh, it's gone up by 2%. It's gone up by 10%. It's gone up by, it's gone down by 4%, whatever it is. Changes in output, raw, uh, price of raw materials, number of employees, customers, sales output, productivity, profit. Any value that changes over time is pretty useful for this. So let me show you some, okay? So to calculate the index numbers, you, and you do need to be able to do this, so it's really important, okay? Decide decide the base year. Now, that will be told to you unless I can't think of an opportunity where they would ask you to decide your own base year, but essentially it would be the, the one that you want to compare everything else to, which all other figures are going to be compared against, all right? Now, what we do is the value in the period. So what have you got now, or what are you comparing against what are you comparing it to? So what have you got now versus what do you want to compare it to times 100, all right, value in the period now or, or whatever date you're using um, divided by uh, value in the base period in the first one, the, the first comparison one times 100. When you apply this to the base year, it will calculate the base year's index number, which will always be 100 because that's got to be 100%, hasn't it? And then we will be able to show connections from that. So let me show you it in action. Okay, and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to have a go at these uh, really, really quickly. Um, just have a look at the percentage year. It should be really really quick like that you should be able to do it really really quick but let's have a look so we've got our year we've got if you look at the first year we've got 2000 our output was uh, 11300 so let's do our index calculation well for this one what have we got well we've got 11300 divided by our base year base year must be the first year in this regard it's what we're divide, what we're comparing it to um 11300 again times 100 that'll give us our base one won't it all right so we know that the first one you wouldn't even have to do that calculation and you'd be able to tell me um, that that was 100 so in terms of this um for this first one the two, year 2001 the percentage change from the base year wouldn't be that useful it would just be zero wouldn't it because that is the base year there isn't a change from it and then we go to 2001 now this time we use our 12,010 12,010 divided by the base year which is 11,300 times 100 that gives us 106 okay so what's the percentage change um from the base year well it's six percent isn't it can you see so the first one's 100, the second one's 106, so it must be 6%. What about the second one? Well, we've got um, we've, we've got 12,400. We divide it by the original output, which is um, 11,300. We times it by 100, and then that gives us 110. So what's the percentage change between the base year and that? Well, we've got 10% change, haven't we? Okay? That's as simple as it is, really. Um, that's what index numbers allow you to do. They allow you to you know set a base and then go from there. So when we're talking about inflation, we're talking about sales, uh, we're talking about, you know, maybe we could be even talking about things like uh, absentee absenteeism, um, staff turnover, that kind of stuff we could potentially use index numbers for. Uh, but it basically just gives us an easy to read formula. It, you know, it gives us an easy to read bit of data that we can use rather than just saying, um, oh, well, uh, I'll show it you on a pie chart or something. Sometimes it can just be we just want a percentage change, don't we? And the way we can do it is by setting a base level and using it like that. So pretty useful. Okay. Um, 
shows clearly the changes in values over time. Easier to compare that simply looking at raw values. It can be quite difficult to show that, isn't it? If I was to show you those data, uh, you'd probably be able to tell me that they'd increase, but you won't be able to tell me how much. You wouldn't automatically go, oh, that's 6%, that, unless you are a, a whiz. Um, can be applied to many factors that a business would want to see changed over time, like I said. Um, must be remembered that the comparison is to the base year, though, not between any other years. If you wanted to do the, the difference between the other years, you could, um, you'd have to have a look. You could potentially do it from this, couldn't you? Uh, but you'd have to change the base year to this. So if you wanted to do this, you'd have to compare them with each other. So you'd have to have the base year to this and this. It's kind of like just percentage change then, though, isn't it? So you probably better not do it. You're not really using index numbers then if you're using it from that. You're just doing a percentage change between two pieces of data rather than you using um, this as a hundred, basically a hundred percent, and then having a look at the data in comparison. Okay, um, and it says the base year needs changing as over time it becomes less useful to compare against. Why is that? Well, because the future means that the past is less and less useful, isn't it? It doesn't matter if you say, oh, well, how was your, uh, you know, how was your sales 10 years ago? How was your, your sales 20 years ago? Well, why does it matter now? You know, because we're not doing, we're not doing very well right now. So we've got to have a think about it. A year ago, pretty useful. Two years ago, pretty useful. Three years ago, okay. Four years ago, all right. 10 years ago, it's starting to become a bit of a, you know, useless exercise, isn't it? So the, the further we go down, the less useful it is to us. Now, the last one um, that they want us to talk to you about uh, is maps. And maps can be dead useful um, a lot more than you'd expect, and not just from getting a, uh, getting A to B as well. So maps present a useful way of presenting information visually. Using maps is not always suitable, however, or there are... Um, the, sorry, where they are can be uh, an attractive and effective way of presenting business data. So when you can use them, they are pretty useful. And the government love to use um, use maps and things like that. Although they have been avoiding it at the minute because it's drawing attention to things. And I think when you start looking at what data analysis isn't being used, um, it shows why the government don't want to use it necessarily because it, it will highlight bits of data which they don't want to be shouting about. So for example... Um, what businesses and why could use uh, this? Well, we've got budget supermarkets. We've got best areas for growth. Is there certain points of the um, of the country which is um, seeing more growth than others? Um, inferior goods retailers, best areas for growth again. So remember, we said inferior goods, weren't we? These are the things which are um, when we uh, have drops in um, in our salaries, in our uh, wages, that we tend to go to inferior goods, the, the unbranded stuff, if you remember way back then. Um, and we could have a look at, uh, is there parts of the country which are more into inferior goods? Maybe, they're, maybe they've been impacted more. Is there a place where we could op maybe open a pound land or something like that? This is what we'd be looking at. Is it worth it? Rather than going for places where you think, well, they're really, really quite well off i don't think they're going to be interested in the pound land anywhere and um, what businesses and what uh, sorry in uh, and businesses to help set up reasonable sales budgets so who do we need to give more money to you know who, what's going to be the best so let's have a look at this one it says here top 10 areas at risk and this is the i'll just stick it in the middle here it says whoops oh no what i know what i've done <laughs> i've just clicked off it there we go Okay, so um, what we got? The number of households at risk. Uh, people who are at risk of having financial problems, particularly during an economic downturn, although they may not actually have any subprime borrowing. Okay, so we've got low risk to high risk. So who is the most high risk? High risk is Sheffield with 72.2%. So in terms of people at risk. Then we've got Birmingham, uh, Nottingham, Liverpool... Uh, Birmingham, Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Tynebridge, Belfast West. I'm not. It seems to be Northwest, doesn't it? <laughs> so, what could we understand about this? What could we, you know, what is it easy to see? Well, it's easy to see your specific place, isn't it, in comparison to everything else. So, if you want to have a look at data um, spread on it, it's really use, easy to use, um, and it, it can draw attention to it. I'd say a bit of an issue, um, although they've been giving you them here, doesn't tell you lots of information about a lot of it, does it? Doesn't tell you information about this. You can't, unless it's an interactive map, you can't press in and have a look at a specific place. So if I wanted to find out about Preston, um, I can't. If I wanted to find out about, you know, Norwich, I can't, uh, unless it's specifically stated in the data and it depends on what they're trying to tell us, doesn't it? Okay. So let's just recap what we've talked about. 
we've talked about right back here we've got um histograms so if you remember what are histograms histograms look like this the difference between them is that they show data up or how much in that thing but they also show the spread of data how much data they show you in a physical way uh, the uh, how many people are going to be involved in this data set essentially um, then we've got uh, line graphs. Line graphs are pretty useful. They have a piece of continuous data and then the secondary piece of data which shows how things happen over time, doesn't it? It's pretty useful to us and uh, can be good for inflation and things like that. Um, then we have pie charts. Very, very easy to read, but they're not the best um, at showing you know, uh, very specific bits of data or showing things over time because they're just a snapshot. Um, index numbers, very, very useful because we can show things in comparison to one another and the vast majority of the, uh, the time we need to. So if you remember, we always set this as 100. It always comes out as 100% almost and then we've got the percentage change between years to this. Remember the issue with uh, with index numbers is the amount of time that um, that goes and the amount of time that is between you actually doing it can be uh, can mean that it's not actually that useful anymore the, the, the further you go on. Um, and then finally, we've got our maps, which are pretty useful for showing bits of data, can be good for highlighting stuff, especially if it's showing, well, actually, why is there a cluster of things like that? And if you look on this, if uh, the top 10 areas at risk of constituency, numbers of households at risk, percentage of households at risk, um, if you're looking at the northwest um, sort of area, we've got quite a few. It's sort of going down here to the Midlands kind of way, isn't it? Um, is that the Midlands? I'm not brilliant at geography. Should spend more time making myself better, shouldn't I? So that is the start of component two. Anyway, that's the start of the first, you know, the first bit of the year. Um, now, in terms of um, questions and things you would do for that, um, you, you're going to get sort of analysis questions and things like that. And feel free to, you know, as I said, I'm going to upload the, the booklets to, to Teams if you haven't already got them. Feel free to have a look at them. Um, and uh, they basically just put that into a you know an easier to read format and you've got them things like that you don't have to fill them in if you don't want but you can you can have a go at them if you want um sort of get that into your mind now okay so what we're going to do now is we're as we always do let's have a look at uh, the news we're going to have a look at bbc although i am getting naffed off with the bbc I, I can't find um like there's not there's not a better one at this moment in time to, to be talking about for the news because um, but uh, this thing about being unbiased I'm getting fed up of reading opinion pieces and things like this. The idea of the BBC is supposed to be that it's publicly funded so that it gives you unbiased information, or as unbiased as it can be. It's not supposed to be a um, a place where, uh, you know, the loads of opinion comes into it. And I feel like more and more that's happening. I'm not here to subsidise, you know, a media outlet, which is what we're doing it with licence fees and stuff like that. I'm happy to subsidise it if it's usable data, but I'm not happy to subsidise it if it's opinion. And I feel like it's becoming more opinion-based, this, uh, which is worrying. So let's have a little look. So um, we've got, got a range of things about coronavirus, obviously. Uh, billionaire's nephew caught with bugging device. Um, I just wanted to see if we can find any data analysis going on. Um, man breaks into dinosaur exhibit. Go on, we'll have a quick look at that. Why? He was there for about 40 minutes. He wandered through some of the internal areas to check some lockers and doors. Uh, and yeah, he certainly enjoyed his night at the museum. Do they know who it is? Did they get him? Yeah. He climbed up some scaffolding. Usually we don't look at this, stuff like this on, on Mr. Businessman, but uh, nothing's been damaged. <laughs> How strange. He's having a phone call. Yeah, I'm there now. I'm in I'm in there. Yeah, I'm in the uh I'm in the museum right now. What a strange one. Anyway. <laughs> um Oh, this is an interesting one. Let's have a look at is this has this got any data analysis in it by any chance? Uh one click and we were worse off. 
It says some people applying for universal credit for the first time have found themselves worse off than losing their existing benefit payments. The system means legacy payments such as tax credits are stopped when um, someone applies for universal credit, even if the claim is ultimately rejected. One applicant said his family was worse off at the click of a button. Universal credit claims have soared amid the coronavirus outbreak with next figures published on Tuesday. People who have a sudden drop in income for a variety of reasons can claim universal credit. In many cases, this will leave them better off than they would have otherwise been. However, some commonly those with savings may find they are ineligible for universal credit. Even so, existing benefit payments have stopped. This is an issue. I know someone who, who's been in this situation that his partner's got some savings. Um, but it's not the point. Why should you? You know, or use all, use all your savings up. Oh, yeah, that's sensible, isn't it? Trying to get people to be more sensible with money. It's not particularly good, good advice, that. Um, that's crazy. Um, hospitals in Brazil's largest city near collapse. Wow, it's 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 getting out of hand. This isn't it. Although, and 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 I'm speaking I'm speaking to the converted here, aren't I? Because you you students, you already know. Um. I'm I'm really getting fed up already of the of the of the negativity um that we are seeing from the media now that it's students' fault uh that 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 things aren't happening it, well it's not your fault yet it will be your fault when you decide not to go back to to college or school because of fear of not dying um it will be your fault but it's our fault even though we're doing things like this even though we're trying you know we're all lazy we're all you know get back to work you know put yourselves at risk let yourself be a hero the way i interpret that i don't know if you saw that on the daily mail but um the way i interpret that is let yourself be put at risk of dying and um, that's not a particularly safe thing when the british medical association is saying that they don't believe um the data that's an issue isn't it and and uh for them to be completely ignoring that fact is, is very worrying to me. But, you know, they're coming for you next. I bet they start having a go at students. If students don't want to go back, um, they will have a go at them next. Oh, they're all lazy. They don't want to do any work. Meh, 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 meh. It's always just, it's just negativity all the time. Let's look at someone to blame. Who's to blame? Who's to blame? It must be teachers. It must be students. It must be you. It must be you. It must be you. <sighs> anyway. Um, passengers uh, set to halve. It says here, the airline's profit was up 13% on previous year, so that they could use index numbers to have a look at that, couldn't they, if they wanted to? 13% on the um, 885 million. Um, it says, Ryanair is set to cut 3,000 jobs, 15% of its workforce as it restructures to halt with the uh, coronavirus crisis. Um, it's idiot it says, Mike, it Mr. O'Leary repeated his criticism of the quarantine plan, saying it's idiotic and unimplementable. You don't have enough police in the UK. He said the policy had no credibility and predicted that it would be gone uh, by June. Interestingly enough, he's not wrong, is he? I mean, Boris Johnson keeps saying that he's going to tentatively unlock lockdown, but it's not what he's doing. Uh, Ryan uh, said 2021 would be a difficult year as it worked hard to, re, uh, to return to schedule flying, but... It, it said its balance sheet was one of the strongest in the industry with catch reserves of more than four billion. It's good, but if you're making loads of people redundant, then at the same point they'd be saying, uh, you know, why are we doing this? Um, it's not very fair, is it? It's good business, but not very fair on employees, uh, stakeholders, you know. Uh, unlike many flag carrier competitions, Ryanair will not request or receive state aid. Oh, well, well done. <laughs> Ryanair said it could not provide any profit guidance for the current financial year, but it expected to report a loss of more than 200 million. As we look to beyond the next year, it will be significant opportunities for Ryanair's low-cost growth model as competitors shrink, fail, or are acquired by government bailout carriers. Hmm, interesting. Now, um... This is an interesting one. Let's have a look at this. I know I feel like we're, we're, we're moving too much uh, thingies, but this is another bit of data analysis, isn't it? So 5,000 people, this is what we could use. Um, we could perhaps use a histogram to have a look at this about the age brackets of people who are saying this kind of stuff. Um, for the past week, Andrew has been working in a joinery firm in Manchester, but he's one of the thousands of British workers um, worried about the exposure to the coronavirus, coronavirus at work. I wasn't happy to go back as I feel it's too soon, but I feel like I should help the company keep going. This is the problem, isn't it? This is what they've made people feel like, that we can't afford it. But when you look at the data, um, we, pay, we I don't know if you've seen this, but we spent £500 billion 
on uh, the the bailout for the banks in 2008, which was all to do with, remember, um, as we've already talked about, bad lending, about, um, you know, playing with... That was rich people dealing with that. 500 billion, and it's only cost us 80 billion now. Now, it's still a lot of money, but compare it to 2008, 500 billion to get to get the banks out because they were playing with uh, people's lives. They were, they, were, they were playing Russian roulette and they lost, and yet we bailed them out, and now they're willing to put people's lives... This is life and death, mind, and they're not willing to do that it's an interesting concept isn't it um and they've made people feel like that you are being un unpatriotic or some nonsense by not doing it yeah let teachers be uh, be heroes um in other words let, let them put themselves in death's uh, position i don't go to work to um to to do that and the, and the fact that they're using they have the audacity to say that we're trying to disadvantage children why, what have they ever done for disadvantaged children? I've actively tried to help them. What have you done, Mr. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister? Nothing. You've literally done nothing. You, you've never been in a classroom. You've not done that. You've not, <laughs> you know, you've just been hanging about, you know, uh, having a go, shouting racist, racist stuff at people a lot of the time or, or writing nonsense in uh, newspapers. So uh, it, it really doesn't sit well with me when they start trying to have a jab at teachers. Or students, for that matter, trying to use you as leverage to try and make the man on the street turn against everyone, which, which is happening, unfortunately. This is how it starts. Um, I don't want to be unemployed in what I suspect will be a phenomenal global recession, he said. Masks are now mandatory for all employees in the factory where he works, while face shields and gloves may be, uh, must be used when two metres social distancing is impossible. Remember, though, teachers don't need PPE, neither do students, so don't be using them. It's almost like they're trying to encourage us getting it, isn't it? Which is weird. Why would you want to do that? Uh, anyone who doesn't adhere to the new rules will face disciplinary proceedings. Um, his employer has also staggered break times and doubled the number of cleaning shifts, but Andrew, who doesn't like to give his full name, is still worried. It's not a big company, so my confidence in the implementation of safety measures is low, to say the least. Over the past two months, nearly 5,000 people have contacted the health and safety regulator in the workplace. The health and safety executive said 321 cases. Safety inspectors asked employees to demonstrate how new measures have been taken, while 27 employees were ordered to make sa um, safety improvements. All right, okay. For those businesses who do not want to put into place appropriate measures, HSE will continue to use its regulatory browser and secure a compliance. Why are these why are they speaking so weirdly like that? Um it says some people don't seem to be serious about distancing. A couple of times today I've had to step away from one client. The photographer said he didn't want to go back to work, but he had to help the company keep going. Uh, in a year's time, I want them to have a working business. Like this, like it's not your responsibility that. It's the government's responsibility to try and give it use some of that money. You know, use some of the three hundred million that we're getting. We're supposed to be getting from the uh, thingy. That'll that'll offset some of it, won't it? All, all these magical times that twenty twenty was supposed to bring. It's not though, has it? Market data. Let's have a look at this. So, percentage change of the FTSE. How's the FTSE doing? Uh, let's have a look. Does it show you over time? Yeah, let's have a look. So that's today. All right, looks really good, but it isn't because it's only pence. Uh. This is it over a month, three months, as you can see. We, we didn't do very well at the start. This was when the lockdown started, and we're kind of getting okay again. See, as a year, as a year <laughs> you can kind of see that we've not done brilliantly. Um, and things like that. Currencies. How's the pound doing? Oh, do you remember when the US started? It used to be two to one. We used to have two to one. It used to be really good. Uh, Boxall's Luton plant reopens production. Uh, tentative steps, Martin. Tentative steps. I don't know how least tentative we could be. We're opening loads of stuff. Loads of people are going on on um, on public transport. How could you be? You, you've lifted lockdown and you haven't said it, have you? Um. HS2 boss is blindsided with contact to reality. A damning parliamentary report raises questions about the trans... I mean, even this. I'm not being funny, but look at this. Leaders of the HS2 rail project have been blindsided contact. The Public Accounts Committee accused HS2 Limited and the Department of Transport of lacking transparency. It says the committee's report said HS2 was badly off course and urged the government to re uh, regularly update Parliament with accurate information. Um, where are we? How much does it cost? Look at the state. Phase two due to be completed by 2035 to 40. 2028 to 31. Stuff it. Get rid of it. Why bother? For goodness sake, it doesn't, it's not worth it. 
56 billion. And it's put the 56 billion mind. Remember, they've only spent on furlough, they've only spent 80 billion now. And they're, and they're doing this. And they're complaining that they're not able to, and they're forcing people to put themselves in harm's way. He says here, the first phase of the project was written for 250 million to 1.2 billion. When you're talking about mo money like this, it, 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 it's frightening, isn't it, in comparison to what we're talking about? That's the that's the frightening thing. You've got to look. That's what data analysis is all about. It's looking at data in comparison to other things. When you look at the amount of mo uh, government spending that we're doing on furlough stuff, trying to keep people safe, versus um, what they're spending on things like this, it's it's crazy. Royal Mail boss surprise exit. US targets Huawei with tighter chip export rules. <laughs> William Hill punters bet on table tennis in sports lull. William Hill pays its punters that have been betting on table tennis. It said it was part of its alternative products. Yeah, it's because there's no alternative, is there? Revenues have been down, though. Phil, he said from uh, its revenues fell 57% because of the absence of live sport. Good. You know what? Good. Because they're the devil, these people. Um, bookkeepers. No. Dangerous people. Uh, ruin people's lives, these people. Uh, William Hill said it is betting shops will close in the US. The UK retail staff have been furloughed and the bookmaker is topping up the wages to make sure they really receive 100% of the salaries. Well, that's good. I suppose that, that they've got to they've got to be held uh, thingies for that. But considering that they do, you know, people have been suicidal and all sorts because of that, it's not really uh, thingies, isn't it? Um, okay, anyway. That's where we are. So I hope it's been useful. I know that I know that the the stuff I was hoping to get some like uh, coronavirus data or something like that. I'll just have a check. As I said, I, I know that I'll just just check that we've not got um, anything like that. Uh, super rich. Let's. I'll show you what I can see. One second. There you go. I just want. I wanted to see if. I wanted to see if I could find anything. Because usually, they usually do, don't they? They usually tell you. No, I can't see any. All right, we'll, we'll have a look at a different time. I'm sure it's not going to be the last time they talk about um, death rates and things like that. But um, anyway, I hope it's been useful for you. A little bit of a tentative step into second year stuff. A little bit on data analysis there for you. Um, I will see you at 10 a.m. tomorrow. I'll be back on at, uh, at normal time tomorrow. As I said, I've been dealing with uh, making some resources and making some other stuff. Um, so that's why it's been a bit weird on Friday. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't 10 a.m. exactly today. But uh, I hope it's been useful for you. Uh, I will see you at 10 tomorrow. Uh, 